Hi, this is Carrie Bodine, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark Fontijn. Welcome to your two weekly burst of service design inspiration, where you get to learn what some of the world's best service designers are currently doing. We talk about the current state of the industry, exciting new developments, and the challenges that are up ahead. With the Service Design Show, we'll help you to become a better service designer so you can make a bigger impact on the world around us. We bring you a new episode every two weeks, so if you don't want to miss anything, be sure to click that subscribe button. My guest in this episode is Carrie Bodine. Carrie is the co-author of a book called Outside In, The Power of Putting Customers at the Center of Your Business. And Carrie runs her own consulting firm called Carrie Bodine and Company. For the next 30 minutes or so, we'll be talking about topics like, do we even need to create maps? The journey as a key principle for customer experience. And finally, organizing around the journey. If you want to fast forward to one of these topics, check out the episode guide down below in the description, or just stick around and enjoy the whole episode. So let's jump right in. Welcome to the show, Kerry. Thank you. Kerry, I'm uh, really curious. A lot of people probably already know you, but um, do they know the story that you, when you came in touch with service design, have you shared that story ever? When, when was the first time you actually got in touch with service design? Yeah, actually, I was getting my master's degree at Carnegie Mellon, and Shelly Evanson was a visiting professor there and she was teaching a service design class. So that was my first introduction to it. And then um, one of our guest professors was also Mark Reddig, and he showed me the very first journey map that I ever saw. Really? And um, I think it was actually one that Shelley had created. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was my introduction um, back 2002 to 2004-ish. Um, Shelly has yeah. been mentioned a lot on the show as a sort of starting ground for a lot of service designers, service designers related uh, people. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, Gary, so uh, the format of the show is really easy. You gave me three topics that you that are on, on top of your mind right now, and I gave you some question starters, and we'll combine these two and co-create the topics we'll be talking about for the next 30 minutes, right? Sounds great. Are you yeah. ready? I'm ready to go. All right. So let me uh, let me uh, pick the first topic, and um, it's it's a really short one, but I guess you can make anything you want out of it. It's called create maps. What is a question starter that goes along with this one? So my question starter is what if, and it's actually what if we didn't create maps? <clears throat> Which kind of maps are we talking about? Uh, specifically journey maps. <clears throat> so um, when I think about the field of service design and, and you know, people ask me sometimes to define what service design is and you know, it's such a, it's such a loosey goosey um, uh, term that has so many definitions. Um, and I, and it's hard to just say, well, it's, or it's hard not to say, it's just the design of services. Yeah. Um, the way that I like to define service design is that it's the, the design or definition of journeys hmm. and then the underlying ecosystems that are required to support and deliver on those journeys. So the, the journey is really a key part of the discipline of service design for you? It is, yeah, because you know, you can be a product designer or, um, you know, uh, a web designer or, you know, whatever it is, and you can work on a particular thing or particular touch point. But for me, the thing that really makes a service is that it's this connection of various touch points over time. And that's exactly what the journey is, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so it's interesting that for me, this definition or, uh, you know, my definition of, of service design around the journey and then the ecosystem, it really has a, a analogous um, uh, connection to two artifacts that have become very widely known um, throughout the service design world and then beyond, which is the journey map and then the service blueprint. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, 
the interesting thing to me is that the artifacts themselves have really eclipsed the kind of the underlying um, idea of what it is that we're trying to represent or that mm. we're trying to design. Um, and so, so yeah, so my question is, what if we actually didn't create these maps? What if we um, thought about the journey, but, but kind of let go of creating these very precious artifacts? Um, I saw that uh, uh, Damien uh, Kernahan uh, from uh, Proto Partners yeah. in Sydney was on your show, and he was mentioning how we were talking about, uh, you know, the, these artifacts have become these like bright, shiny objects for a lot of organizations, and they feel really great about themselves if they just create a map. Um, but that's really missing the point. It's like the the artifacts came out of a philosophy about the way that we need to be thinking about designing for people. Hmm. Um, and so, so for me, it's about letting go of that. that that's, um, <clears throat> that, that, this has been a topic for in, in a lot of episodes, the, the shiny map. Uh, the, the first episode that Mark sticked on was, the, I think the customer journey shouldn't be a deliverable, uh, with yeah. some added words in there. Um, <laughs> yeah. But if we let go of the artifact um it isn't <laughs> that's a that's a san francisco train in the background right it is yeah <laughs> <laughs> so if we let go of the map um don't we lose something that's that's really useful in actually uh, um, explaining what we do and showing what we do or is there something that that's even better Sure. So I, I mean, I do think maps can be valuable for exactly that reason. Um, I look at them as visual storytelling tools, which, you know, for me, the just thinking about who we are as um, humans that have evolved over time, we have evolved to um, be visual and, you know, we can recognize and understand visual information um, much more easily, much more quickly than we can, you know, a, a long text that we actually have to like sift through and digest. Um, and we are also natural born storytellers, right? This is how we've passed down our human culture for, you know, thousands and thousands of years. And so for me, the, the journey map itself as an artifact is a really great visual storytelling tool and it can be very powerful um, if you think about it that way. <clears throat> but I don't think a lot of people are, are embarking on the creation of a journey map um, thinking about a specific story they're trying to tell and thinking about how to best visualize it in order to really punch people in the gut um, with, you know, the the conflict and, and all of that, um, you know, that, you know, the, the parts of a, a story that, you know, we're all familiar with from, you know, watching movies or, or reading books or whatever it is. So, you know, I, I do think that they can be valuable for, from that perspective, but, um, you know, there's, there's also just so much additional work that goes before mm, right. the storytelling part of it. So I was actually talking with someone um, from a regional bank um, earlier this week and um, doing research on um, journey maps right now. And um, she told me when we got on the phone, she was like, well, I, I think you're going to be really disappointed because we actually haven't created any maps. Um, themselves. And I said, Oh, you know, tell me what you're doing. And she had attended a workshop, just like a three hour intro to journey mapping workshop that I had done a couple of years ago at um, a, a CX conference. And, um, you know, just, you know, putting sticky notes up on the wall and, you know, learning the, the true, just kind of basic, um, uh, you know, actions and, and, you know, what you have to go through. And she took that home and back to her organization and that's what she's been doing. They put up, you know, a big sheet of paper on the wall. They get people from multiple parts of the organization, frontline folks, people from their branches, people from operations, and they get them together and they talk about the journey and what's going wrong from the customer perspective. And from my perspective, that's what's important, right? I mean, it, it gives them 
a framework to talk about things that they didn't have before. And she was telling me how, um, you know, there was just a lot of finger pointing beforehand, uh, you know, people in the branch saying, well, this is what ops is doing wrong and ops saying this is what people in the branch are doing wrong. But when they come together and they're like, okay, we're going to look at this from the perspective of the customer's experience, that that kind of end to end journey, um, that finger pointing goes away and they all mm -hmm. just kind of self organize around this common goal. Um, so I, I love that. And they've had, um, you know, they've been able to identify um, a bunch of initiatives that don't cost a lot of money that are making significant improvements to the customer experience. Um, but they haven't created any maps at mm -hmm. all. It's just been sticky notes. Um, you know, on the wall of a conference room and getting people mm. together from across the organization to, to talk and identify issues. So it's like um, um, the, the time we invest in creating uh, customer journey maps that look really good. We, um, maybe it would be smarter to actually treat maps as prototypes, so making them sketchy, rough, and uh, actually throwing them away after, uh, after a session, something like that, not getting attached. <clears throat> yeah, I like that. We actually just released a, a PowerPoint journey map template on our website. And um, part of the reason why we wanted to put a PowerPoint template out there is because we didn't want people to get too attached to it, right? It's like, you can we, create we a need, We need a Snapchat for customer journeys. Like, this journey only exists in second. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. But yeah, you know, we have a million PowerPoint templates and, you know, and PowerPoint presentations and people can create them pretty quick and pretty easily. Um, you know, making something that's like beautiful and illustrator, it's like, okay, yeah, if it, maybe there are some instances where that's warranted, um, depending on who your audience is for the story that you're trying to yeah. tell and all that. Yeah. But yeah, it does make it seem like this is, this is a, an artifact for all time. So, so <clears throat> to conclude this first topic, what you're basically saying is think about the journey, forget about the map. Yes. Something like that. I love it. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Gary, let's move on to your, to your second topic. And um, your second topic is called key principle for customer experience. So I would say, what if? What if? What if we rethink the key principle for customer experience? So I think that, well, even going back to um, my, my book, Outside In, the subtitle is The Power of Putting Customers at the Center of Your Business. And so the idea is like, you know, it has been really bringing customer insights in. Um, to the organization. Uh, there's been a lot around driving employee engagement and culture um, as some of, the, I think, the, the key principles. Um, but again, I think there's value in getting away from, I mean, not getting away from that. All of that is, of course, important, but, but really realigning around um, this core principle of the customer journey. Um, and and really having the journey be the principle that that drives all customer experience effort, efforts. Um, so McKinsey did a report. Um, it came out in March of 2016, and they basically did some analysis. And and I unfortunately don't know all the details of this, but they found that when you look at journeys. Um, the, the performance of, uh, of companies, the economic outcomes are significantly greater than if you just try to optimize individual touch points or channels. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so that's really it. It's, it's really about, um, shifting, shifting our entire mindset. And actually I, I would argue this isn't just a key principle of, of customer experience. I think that this needs to be a key principle of our organizations. Doing so, business, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. We, we've been built around efficiency for so long, and <clears throat> and this makes sense, right? Like, so I have a two, whopping two-person company right now, right? Um, and so there's some division of labor that that we have, but. I am essentially our marketing team, and um, you know I'm making updates on the website, and I'm human Love resources. Love T-shaped people. <laughs> What's that? T-shaped people. That's what yes, we are. Yes, exactly, exactly. 
Um, and so, yeah, and T-shaped people are great, but you know, when when you're trying to play many, many roles in an organization, you of course get spread very thin, right? I'm trying to do finance stuff and marketing stuff and actually do research and you know do work for clients. Um, and so this is why, you know, a uh, hundred plus years ago, we started to have this strong focus on uh, specialized roles within our organizations, and we were focused on efficiency, right? We have, you know, a marketing department, we have a development department, we have a finance department, and everyone can specialize in in what they do, um, and that is great. And and I don't think we can get away from that because I can tell you, you know, just from my own experience you can't do everything all the time, right? If, if you're gonna really grow and, and be you know, a, a large organization. And so certainly during the industrial revolution and um, you know, the, the mass production of products, Henry Ford, of course, yeah, we yeah, like yeah. really created a, a science around all of this. Um, but this efficiency is, is one point of view, right? It, it is, um, you know, the, the organizing principle that we have had, not just in customer experience, um, but certainly there as well, but, but within our entire organizations. And I, I think it's really important for us to look that in the face and recognize the parts of that that are beneficial for our organizations. It doesn't make sense to have a finance person also be developing your website. Um, but we also have to realize that it is a point of view, that it isn't the way that um, organizations have to exist and that we have to take the good parts of that but supplement them with other ways of organizing ourselves and our work in order to truly deliver on this promise of, of customer experience and the customer journey being you know, a, a path to better economic outcomes. So this is probably something uh, a lot of people who are watching this episode applaud and, and can relate to. But how do we, uh, what do you do to extend this story beyond our community, right? How do you, how do you get business people that are um, organized in their head around efficiency to, to, to join in on, on, the, on this story? What, what well, works for you? Yeah, I think that um, I think that part of it has been what we've all been preaching within the service design community and the greater customer experience community and the and the larger business world, really understanding customers, right? And so that's why you know we we don't want to I don't want to move away from that, right? This is you know just a, a full um, you know turn to something very specific, but I, but I think it's. Um, and, and in the opposite direction, but I think it's um, it, it's just a greater awareness that um, you know the the market is changing, consumers have greater power, and we need to understand our our customers better. I think that's really the first step. We can then introduce this concept of the journey as um, as a way to connect our silos. Mm -hmm. But I think it's first understanding, you know, just how much customers have changed and how much we really need to understand it. Mm -hmm. so understand customers. What is your, um, what is the question you have around this topic of the key principle? What challenges you when you think about this topic? Well, what challenges me is really, I think, the, um, again, multiple hundreds of years of history that have been ingrained in the way that, that we all work. I mean, if you ask anyone about the silos within their organization and, um, you know, how well they communicate across silos, you know, every organization has challenges. Um, you know, anytime you get even just a handful of people, um, you know, in an organization, startups certainly um, struggle with this all the time. You know, everything's fine when there's two or three people, but all of a sudden there's 10 people and, you know, the communication starts to break down because not everyone is involved in every single decision. Um, and so, so for me, it's just this, this history that is ingrained in us and um, you know our inertia we, we 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 recognize that the silos are a problem um, but it's this inertia for getting away um, from that hmm. Hmm. Yeah. that's the challenge 
<clears throat> Maybe that's a nice uh, stop up for the, the, the third topic. Um, so let, let's see how, uh, how this works out. And the third topic is called, uh, yeah, let organize around. <laughs> that's Dutch for around. <laughs> 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 Organizing around the journey. Yes. So maybe my question is how far should we go to organize around the customer journey? Um, I don't know if I reused any of those questions or not, but that's, that's what that's I'm okay. using. Um, so yeah, I, I think that this really needs to be something that we make tangible in our organizations, not, not just an idea, right? Oh, the journey is a nice concept, right? I mean, the journey is floating out there on multiple levels, right? On the one hand, it's the artifact. On the other hand, it's this kind of nebulous concept. And I think that we, we do need to make the journey tangible, um, but we need to make it tangible in the way that we work together every single day. And so I do believe that we need to start bridging the silos in our organizations with people whose job it is is to look after the customer journey and really own that customer journey. So, you know, we've had product managers in our organizations for decades. Um, and, you know, this is a, a very common role now, um, both in, you know, huge, massive legacy organizations and in startups. Um, and for me, the role of, um, uh, this new role that I'm talking about is, is very similar, could be very similar to what that product management role is today within organizations. So thinking about a journey manager as someone who owns the vision for a particular journey um, really is responsible for understanding the gaps in it, understanding, um, yeah, what customers really want and need, understanding the competition, making the business case for it, and then wrangling people across all those silos um, to make that vision for the journey come to life. And I, and I think that's one of the key things with this is that the, the product manager within an organization, you know, the development team doesn't report up to the, the product manager, right? But they're still beholden to the product manager in some way. And it's the product manager who is on the line for making sure that that product vision comes to life in, in certain ways and meets business goals in, yeah. in some ways as well. Um, and that's really, that's really what I see happening. Um, and I have seen it in a few organizations. There's a um, utility company here in the US that has actually um, created this journey manager role. And it's actually um, directors and VPs, and they look at every part of the customer life cycle and broken it into journeys. And then it it's kind of the new matrix. Um, you know, mm -hmm, we, mm -hmm. I think we created matrix organizations because we realized um, that we were stuck in our silos and people needed to have multiple reporting roles. And there's a whole mess of problems, of course, with matrix reporting structures. Um, but this is kind of similar because you can think about, you know, the journeys kind of cutting across our, our vertical silos or channels or functional areas of expertise, which, again, we've created because we need that level of efficiency within our organizations, but we need to bridge them with these roles that are looking across. So uh, the question that was in my mind is, do you, have you seen this implemented in a good way? And you talked about the utility company. Do you know any other examples? And what, <clears throat> what did they do to actually make this a success? Well, I think it's I think it's um, a, a nascent practice for sure, um, and so I don't have a lot of great examples. Um, but from here in Silicon Valley, I mean, this is the way that a lot of tech companies have been organizing themselves for years. So um, when I think about eBay, years and years ago, they had their design teams divided by. Um, buying and selling. There was a buying journey on their site and there was a selling journey on their site. 
Um, and they had design teams focused on those two things. Um, over at Uber, um, they've got teams that are devoted to driver journeys and teams that are devoted to rider journeys and then mm -hmm. even very specific mm -hmm. journeys within within um you know those two kind of uber categories <laughs> um but um so so i think that actually the the field of design is a, a good leader um and uh you know a place that we can we can look to for this because they've started to organize that way anyway I'm, I'm really curious, this was a topic on the show, for instance, with uh, Annie Paulain, where we talked about the journeys are fractal. So you, you can divide every journey into uh, endless sub-journeys. You know, it, it will be interesting to see how, how large of a chunk of a journey a journey manager can or should handle, right? Because if yeah. you narrow it down to a, yeah, yeah, to a single touch point, that, that will be interesting to see. Yeah, you know, I often get that question a lot um, from clients is like, how big of a journey should we should we, you know, bite off? And it's like, well, I mean, on the one hand, you can look at the entire journey of, you know, your customer becoming a becoming a customer and then leaving you, you know, eventually. But you're not going to be able to get to a good level of detail with with that type of journey to actually start making decisions and um, understanding what to implement and, and what to change. Um, on the other hand, um, I've worked with a company that journey mapped out with their customers um, the whole process of signing up for an account and resetting their password. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, at first blush, that was a pretty, um, a pretty <laughs> fractalized, <laughs> that's a word, a pretty fractalized journey. Um, but it was actually quite complicated and um, took a lot longer than I thought it did and crossed more channels than I thought it would. Um, but I think for this, I think for this journey manager role or journey owner role, I think looking at um, just some of the key parts of the customer life cycle is a good place to start. Maybe breaking the customer life cycle into four, five, six, seven chunks and starting there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, but but of course it's going to vary for every organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And will be interesting to see if we find some sort of a sweet spot and and in which situations. Yeah. <clears throat> Gary, um, to round off uh, uh, the show, I always ask people, and you do a lot of public speaking, so you get approached probably by a lot of people. And when people ask you, Gary, could you give me um, an advice or well, let me frame it differently. Carrie, if they ask you, Carrie, what is the topic that keeps you awake at this moment? What are your, what is your biggest question? And what is the question that you might want to share with the audience? Hmm. So, um, yeah, my biggest question right now is um, really about the future kind of macroeconomic state of the world and um, how things are going to change potentially um, because of recent political um, changes, especially here in the US, um, but how you know that ripples across the world. And um, you know it's interesting when when companies go through a hard economic time, and I'm not saying they're going to, but you know there's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now. Um, you know, companies kind of tend to have two different approaches to customer experience. One is um, it's the first thing to get cut because it's seen as fluffy and, you know, not a you know, core part of the operations of the organization. Or they double down and they say, you know what, we need to make sure that of everyone out there, we are providing the best customer experience so that we can get whatever dollars are available. Um, but for me, um, uncertain economic times bring a lot of uncertainty to um, the customer experience world and the design world in general. So that I think is probably the biggest thing keeping me up at night. Um, I think if there's a question for the viewers that I have, it's, you know, how are you making your role and the role of service design and customer experience essential to your organization so that 
um, you know, if if we do go down um, a, a bad path uh, uh, from a global economic scale, that you'll be ready to help your organization push through that successfully. Awesome. Really curious, and uh, share the comments uh, in, in in the comments section. Really curious. Big question, though. Um, <laughs> I think that surprised you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have holistic uh, holistic topics on on the show. Carrie, I really want to thank you for your time and sharing. Uh, yeah, the things that you are thinking about and working on. Uh, it it was my pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure too. What are your thoughts about the topics we've just discussed with Kerry? Let us know down below in the comments. The Service Design Show is all about helping you to become a better service designer by sharing real life stories of people that are currently shaping the field. If this is your first time here and you'd like to see more interviews, be sure to check out some of the past episodes. And if you haven't done it already, click that subscribe button. For now, Thanks for watching and I'll see you in two weeks time for a new episode.